is raised in songs of thanksgiving for all that God is doing for us. Come and let us worship her with our whole hearts. May our praise and voices resound with joy. Amen. Amen. Hear these words from Psalm, the 30th chapter. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me, O Lord. You have brought up my soul from Sheol, restored me to life from among those gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord. O oh, you, his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may no longer be the night, but joy comes with mourning. As for me, I am my prosperity. I, ne I shall never be moved. By your favor, O oh Lord, you have established me as a strong mountain, you hid your face, and I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my death? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it tell you of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me, O Lord. Be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. 
You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy so that my soul may praise you and not be silent, O Lord. May God, I will give thanks forever. Amen. As we respond to the word of God, please let us stand together as we are able and we sing this song, Christ the True and Better, in which we talk about the fullness of the story of God. And this morning, Dighton often does this with, with the choir and, and Spirit Winds and other musical members. But I want to take a second this morning to just appreciate uh, a couple of our youth, our high school youth, and Kayla, uh, one of our college students. She uh, offered to come back and, and play with us and help lead us in worship. And so as we sing this song about the full story of God and the fullness of God's work in the world, um, I think it's fitting to be led by some of our, our younger members. So please join in with us and, and enjoy being a part of this. Let's sing. Sing Christ the True. In Christ the true and better Adam, Son of God and Son of Man, who went tempted in the garden, never yielded, never sinned. He who makes the many righteous brings us back to life again. He reversed the curse and rise in Christ a serpent's head. In Christ the true and better rise, humble son of sacrifice, who would climb the fearful mountain, dare to all. The true and better David, lowly shepherd, mighty king, he the champion in the battle, where all death is now thy sting. Amen. 
Amen. And thank you to Alan and the worship team. You all were amazing. And church, please join me as we go on to our time of prayer. Heavenly God, we thank you for gathering us here in this place today to worship your name, to fellowship, and learn more about your teaching. We give thanks for you for many things in our lives, for the ways you made a way out of no way for the times you showing up when we didn't think you were there. We thank you for all that you do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly God, we come, to, come now to confess all our sins to you, for all of our shortcomings, for all the times we've made choices that don't go for you, for our selfishness and all our wrongdoings. We come now asking for your forgiveness and and to guide us and help us learn and learn to forgive others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we pray for all these people here at Chapel Hill and all the ministries of this church, God. We ask that you provide answer to, to needed prayers, prayers that have been spoken and prayers that have not been spoken, Heavenly God. We ask that you provide healing and solution and health to all people in this church. And we ask that all the, all the ministries of this congregation, Lord God, continually be used by you to glorify your name and to point more people to you so we can continue to live into that mission of making disciples for the transformation of the world, Lord God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Heavenly God, we pray for this world, this world full of hurt, this world full of brokenness, this world full of chaos. Heaven, God, we ask that you speak into the chaos. Matter of fact, God, we ask that you show up in the chaos and that the world sees you even through the darkness of this world, God. We ask for that these leaders of this world, Father, make decisions to honor and glorify you, God. We ask that the people of Chapel Hill, that as we go into this world, that we reflect you, Lord God. And we just ask that your blessing and your hand of protection is upon this world. And that you just guide us through this current time and bring us to a better day that looks more like you. Heavenly God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we thank you for all that you've done. We ask that in this time, in this place, your Holy Spirit is upon us. It wakes us up and it equips us to go out into this world today and this week and be your vessels and be your advocates, be your light to others who we encounter, God. We ask that you open our hearts and minds to all you have to show us, not only today, but every day through our lives. Let us love you. And let us love others and let us look more like you every single day. And all these things, Lord, I have to give you praise and thanks. And we all say, Amen. Please stand as you are able. Hear these words from Psalm, the 19th chapter, verse 9 through 11. I fear the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinance of the Lord are true and righteous together. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and dripping of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Repeat to the Father and to the Son and As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. You 
may be seated, and let's uh, <clears throat> bow for a, a word of prayer this morning. Let's pray together. Gracious Lord, again, we are grateful that you've gathered us in this place on this day, giving us the opportunity to offer to you our worship as our thanks and our gratitude to you for all that you have done, to remember who we are and to whom we belong, to hear your words to us as they encourage us and lift us up and guide us in the ways that we should go and correct us when we stray. So again, we pray today that you would give us ears that we might hear you and minds that we would understand it and hearts that are ready to receive it so that it would take root in each of our lives and bear fruit, but not for our sake only, also for the sake of the world that you've entrusted to us, and we'll be careful to give you all of the thanks. We pray it all in the name of Christ our Lord, and together we all say amen. <clears throat> I am reminded of my first, one of my first appointments in Texas while in seminary. I see some of you out here fanning. My, my appointment at Chatfield, Texas was a church that celebrated its 150th while I was there. It was the oldest church in the district. And for 150 years, they did not have air conditioning. They had these old tilt-out windows. You remember those? They just unhooked them and you tilted them out. And you had ceiling fans and you had the little hand fans. And you know what I'm talking about, right? The hand fan that had a picture of Jesus on one side. And you flipped it over and it was the local funeral home information on the other side. And everybody was doing this. And they didn't have air conditioning until its 175th birthday. <laughs> um, I was long gone, thank goodness, from that hot down in the central Texas. It was miserable. So if you feel like you need to fan, you fan. Uh, we'll have this up and running next week. I, before I jump into the sermon, I want to uh, uh, include something uh, that we're going to encourage you to do. Uh, you've heard me say, and you'll hear me say it again today, that John Wesley was a practical theologian, a practical-minded man, always wanted to give the people of the church a practical ways to live out their faith. So we've done that for you this morning. Sometime after communion or when you come up to take communion, we want you, if you feel led to, please don't feel obligated to, but if you would like to on your way back to your seat, pick up one of these little journals that are laid out on the altar for communion. And we want you to take this home with you and use it as a practical way to, to apply these three rules we've been looking at over the past three weeks. And bring it with you next week because next week we start a new series on some of the spiritual disciplines that the church has practiced over the centuries uh, as a way of drawing us closer to God and deeper in our faith. And it kind of dovetails very nicely with these general rules we're looking at. And we would just want to give you the opportunity, if you feel led to do it, take one of these journals, take it home, use it every day as a way of applying these general rules and the, the, the uh, uh, spiritual disciplines we'll be looking at next week and the weeks ahead. Uh, I would suggest at the end of each day, sometime before you go to bed, just uh, review the day and write it in your journal. You might ask your, yourself, where did I do harm today? And write that in the journal as a form of confession. And ask your, yourself, what did I do good or what good did I do today? And write that in the journal as a, a, a moment of gratitude. And ask yourself, what ordinances, which we'll look at here in a moment, what ordinances of God did I take part in today that drew me closer, or drew me deeper into my discipleship? Was it prayer or was it studying the scriptures or whatever? And just write that down as a way of reviewing the day. Uh, and I hope you'll do that every night before you go to bed and then bring it with you each Sunday starting next week and make notes in it for your uh, spiritual disciplines that we'll be looking at. Wesley had a practice of reviewing his day every day in his journal. Um, and often you'll see he used those rules, even though he didn't call them the general rules, of what he did that was harmful maybe to someone, uh, a word of anger, what good he did for someone that day, uh, and what he did to develop his spiritual life. So this is a very Wesleyan thing to do. It's a very practical thing to do, and we hope you'll feel led to take one of these home uh, when you come up for communion. I'll remind you in a few moments, but it's a great way for us to put into practice uh, what Wesley and what the church has taught us 
over the centuries. So let's review where we've been so we know where we are. We began three weeks ago looking at what became known as the general rules of Methodist Church that Wesley gave to a group of new converts to the faith, new members of the Methodist movement when they came to him asking for some practical suggestions on how to live out their faith to be better disciples. And so he spent some time with them and gave them these three, we call them the general rules. They are not a complete set of ethics. They are guidelines that guide us uh, in the ways that uh, we should go in developing our faith, growing deeper in our discipleship. And we began three weeks ago with that first rule, and that was what? Going to have to speak loudly. The fans are blowing. Yeah, do no harm of any kind. And I think Wesley meant by that, we are to avoid doing harm of any kind to, our, to, to one another or to our relationship with God by avoiding things like quarreling amongst ourselves, gossiping about someone, uh, refusing or, or choosing not to love and respect others as we want to be, uh, seeking revenge, uh, refusing to take a Sabbath day in the best sense of the word or the phrase, and by using God's name in any way other than the most reverent of ways. We're to avoid, that's just a partial list, doing harm of any kind. Then last week we looked at the second rule, which was what? Do good of every possible kind. Now, Wesley just helped us remember what that meant by repeating what Jesus taught us. We are to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, give water to the thirsty, welcome the stranger among us, tend to those who are, who are sick or in prison, those sorts of things. But we also learn that Wesley said or, or that the disciples of Jesus are to go beyond just normal things of doing good. We are to do good even to those who hate us, to those who, who persecute us in some way, mistreat us, to those who speak evil to us or against us or about us, that we are to go out of our way to do good even to them. And we are to do even more than that. We are to look for opportunities to do good. Remember, rather than waiting for an opportunity to do good, to rise up, to, to, to come at us, we are to go and search for opportunities to do good. So we are to do good of every possible kind. In fact, doing good to those who hate us and looking for opportunities to do good is what makes disciples different. And that today we come to that last one. Next week we start a new series, a new focus, but today we look at that third um, general rule, that third guideline that Wesley gave. And in Wesley's words, it was to attend upon all the ordinances of God. I want to flesh that out here in a minute. Attend upon all the ordinances of God. Now, up to this point, the other two rules that we have looked at, do no harm and do good, those rules could be taken up by any religious person or any social service agency in town as a guideline for how to go about their living or to go about the work they do. Those two rules could be taken up by any person or any group to guide them in what to do and what not to do. But this third rule is given for a purpose, a, a, a specific purpose. The general rules, remember, were not given to society. They were given to the church. And this third rule contradicts the idea that Methodism is just a set of pious rules and regulations to follow. It goes beyond that, way beyond that. It contradicts that idea. It addresses, in Wesley's thinking, this rule addresses every, uh, the need for every believer, including Methodist, to do everything they can to tend to or to take care of our spiritual natures, our spiritual lives. So it contradicts this idea that it's just following rules and regulations and goes at doing whatever we need to to take care of our spiritual nature. Now let's break it down. What is an ordinance? 
An ordinance is defined as a prescribed usage or practice or ceremony. In other words, in a biblical sense, an ordinance is any practice, any ceremony, any ritual, any, you could say, habit we have that we take part in that helps us deepen our faith and deepen our discipleship. Are you with me? That is an ordinance. Whatever practice, ritual, ceremony we take part in that helps us uh, uh, deepen our spiritual lives. Now, I said earlier, and I've said every week, Wesley was a practical theologian, a man of practical divinity. He wanted to make sure that everyone who claimed to be a believer was given a practical way of living out his or her faith. Not just talk about it, but to actually put it into practice, to live it out. And he was keenly aware that there is a vast difference, there is a universe of difference between being a member of a church and being a member of a club. Right? You go to a club. We go to a club whenever it's convenient. We go to the club whenever, whenever, it's, whenever we choose to. We go to a club because we like its privileges it affords us. But in the church, there are no privileges. We have expectations, but we don't have privileges. And Wesley wanted people to understand that. Any serious believer, Wesley thought, needs to know what is expected of him or her as a believer, as a member of some church. And I think that's part of what Wesley is getting at with this third rule. What is expected of you and me as members of a church, as believers who are involved in a community of faith? So for Wesley, he defined an ordinance as any practice, any practice or ritual or ceremony or habit taught in the Scripture and practiced by Jesus himself. And he had six of them. He identified six. I think there are probably more, but he identified six key ordinances that he believed every believer should, t- uh, should attend to. And this morning, I'm going to go over all six of them. Don't worry. It's going to be brief. Okay? I'm going to touch on each one, kind of explain what it means, and I encourage you then to write these down or remember them and then dive deeper into them for yourself, okay? This is just to get you on the, the road to what an ordinance is, is in, the, in the life of discipleship, in the life of a church. Just briefly mention them, explain them, uh, six of them, so you can dive deeper in for yourself. Now, the first two I'm going to tie together. Because one is naturally, in my thinking, an extension of the other. But Wesley listed them as two. So don't think I've missed one when we get to the end. And I've only mentioned five. I've mentioned six. The first two are tied together, okay? So the first two ordinances that Wesley said we should attend to are public worship and what he called the ministry of the Word, which, by which he meant preaching and teaching the gospel. Okay, hearing it preached and taught. So public worship and preaching the gospel. Now, Christians must attend worship, public worship, gather together like we're doing now for the sake of our own spiritual health. We have to gather together. That's not to say that we should not worship privately or by ourselves But our development, our discipleship deepens and strengthens only when we gather together to worship, where our thinking is challenged, where we are encouraging one another, where we stand side by side with one another in worship. So Wesley said we should gather publicly. It is public worship that most refreshes us and renovates us and fits us for the day-to-day living. Private worship is good. But public worship is where we are made stronger in our faith. It feeds us spiritually. 
No other setting in life feeds the spiritual life what it needs more than the act of worshiping together. Failing to attend worship together is a spiritual loss. Continued failure to attend public worship often leads to a forgotten church and a forgotten God. So public worship is crucial. Now, throughout the Scriptures, we are reminded over and over of how important public worship is, as well as the reading, or I mean the hearing, and the preaching of the gospel, of the, of the Word, as Wesley put it. And we look at the gospels, just look at the four gospels carefully, and you realize how important worship was to Jesus. We are told over and again, Jesus had this custom, this what? Habit, this ritual of worshiping on the Sabbath. And we are encouraged not to fail in gathering together for public worship and the reading or hearing and preaching of the gospel. Now, worship is not and never has been, not in the history of the church, has worship ever been intended as a spectator sport where people just gather in the pews or in the chairs and they watch some person up here preaching or they listen to the musicians and the choir. That's not worship, right? That's what I call the sit and soak method where you just sit back and you absorb everything, all right? That's not worship. From the very beginning, worship has been a a community thing, a participatory event where we all, in fact, the word liturgy, which is what we do every Sunday, means the work of the people, not the work of the pastor, not the work of the choir or the musicians, everybody. That's what worship is, right? It's not intended for you to sit back and watch. That's worship done for you. That's not worship. So we gather together to take part in worship. And for every genuine believer, participation in worship is not a burden. It's more than a duty. Genuine worship is a joy when we come to worship with an open mind and a sincere heart. So everything we do in worship every Sunday is not some random thing we just throw together. Every responsive reading, every song we sing, every word we share together, every prayer we pray, the giving and receiving of offerings and tithes, everything is a participation, right? Is an act of worship. And by the way, when it comes to songs, if we sing a song you don't know, you don't know the music to it, you've never heard it before, that's okay. I encourage you in those moments when you're not aware or you're not uh, familiar with a song, instead of instead of taking it to me or to Alan or someone and saying, I don't know that song, my response will be, that's okay. Good, because it's not about us. Take that song and listen to the words, read the words, and make it your prayer. Right? Everything we do, we do together for the purpose of deepening our faith. So Wesley said, attend public worship and listen to the word that is preached and taught, the gospel. Now, The third one, remember those were two, the third ordinance that Wesley said we should attend to, we're going to do today, and that is the service of communion. Now, some traditions call that the Lord's Supper, right? Others call it the Eucharist. But whatever we call it, communion is the most sacred service of the church. It's not to be done frivolously. It's not to be hurried We're not to enter into it or take part in it lightheartedly. In fact, that's one of my pet peeves. I'll just confess it. 
And I've served churches like this where they come down for communion and there is talk among them in the, in the line as they're waiting to receive it about last night's football game or some other nonsense, right? This is a sacred moment. It is the highest, most sacred moment in the life of the church is taking part in communion. It's not done lightheartedly or frivolously or without consideration. And Methodists believe that, the, that communion is a means of grace. It is a gift from God. That's why we encourage you to come to the table with your hands extended, ready to receive, not take. It is a gift that is given. It's not something we do. This is something God does for us. We receive it, not take it. And so no one, we believe, Methodists, no one, is to be denied access to the table. No one. And you know why? Because this isn't the church's table. It's not my table or Kevin's or, or, or Marilyn's or any. This is a table that you dedicated to the work of the church. So no one is to be denied an invitation to it. If we decide, me or you, get to decide who's worthy to come, guess what? None of us would be invited. So this is a moment of grace. It's a gift that God gives us. No one who desires to live a life that is pleasing to God should be denied an invitation. And even those who are not members of the church are invited to come. Why? Because we don't get to decide who's worthy. And we, we understand that this moment of communion is a gift of grace, that anybody can experience the grace of God up here as well as anywhere else. So everyone is welcome. Now, we believe that communion is both a memorial and what I call a living experience. It's a memorial in that it brings to mind all that Jesus taught us, all that Jesus calls us to do and to be, to remember the works of Jesus on our behalf. But it's also a living experience because we take part in it with a sincere heart and are both blessed by it and, in, and strengthened by it. It's an experience we have. And so Wesley said, as Methodists, we must attend upon the ordinance of communion because it reminds us of how much God has done for us. It is where we find comfort and strength, and it is where we are reminded not just of who we are, but of whose we are. So we should attend to the ordinance of communion on a regular basis. Wesley did it every week. Fourth, Wesley said we should attend upon the, the, uh, the ordinance of prayer, both private and he called family or public prayer. Perhaps this is the most difficult one for a lot of us to do because it seems like the individual members of a family are so scattered with their own work and their own agendas and their own things for the day that they must get done. It seems like none of us spends enough time developing our prayers like we should. But the Scriptures suggest that prayer is an essential part of our faith, essential part of the health of ourselves, our spiritual health, as well as our families and our, our communities of faith. Now, private prayer is something the Scriptures speak about fairly often something Jesus practiced regularly. Again, if you look through the Gospels, you'll notice how Jesus it plays out in Jesus' life. Jesus is with the crowds and with his disciples, and then he does what? He sneaks off <laughs> by himself, comes back with the crowds, with his disciples, and he sneaks off again, something he did on a regular basis. So ask yourself, if Jesus found it necessary to pray by himself or pray at all, how much more should his disciples find it necessary? What makes us think we can make it through the world without some sort of regular contact with the one who calls us here? And that prayer can take any form. I mean, you, you know, you can pray it out loud like we do here on Sundays. You can pray it in your mind quietly as you're driving to work. I know people for whom gardening is an act of prayer. 
I know others for whom singing is an act of prayer. Whatever form it takes, practice it. Tend to it. Today we hear a lot about peace of mind and peace of spirit. But the peace the Scripture talks about is the peace that comes from when you and I take regular time to involve ourselves in prayer, whatever form that takes. No matter how hectic life is, no matter how rushed life becomes, Wesley said we must take time to pray. In fact, the busier we get, the more intentional our prayer should be. So tend to the ordinance of prayer. Number five. Wesley said we should always attend to the ordinance of what he, re, he phrased as searching the Scriptures, studying the Scriptures. That is one of the cornerstones that Wesley built the, the Methodist movement on. In fact, it is the cornerstone that Wesley used to build the Methodist movement. Wesley referred to himself as a man of one book, the Scripture, the Bible. Now, that's not to say that's the only book he ever read. But it was the one book that he based everything on in his life and in his ministry. And it was that one book that guided Wesley in everything he did. It was his guide in his faith, what he should believe, and his guide in how he should practice it, put it into practice. It is to guide us not just in our faith, but in how we live out our faith. How can we say we are people who believe in the Scriptures if we don't know what the Scriptures say, if we don't study them. Twenty-five years ago, give or take, Dr. Watson, a Methodist scholar, phrased Wesley's understanding of Scripture like this. He said, the Scriptures are the chart by which we sail the seas. It is the map by which we walk. It is the sundial by which we set our lives. It is the balance in which we weigh every action. That's how Wesley understood it. The Scripture is that one book we are to study, that we are to search through every day. And by studying the Scripture, it becomes to us, as the psalmist said, a lamp unto our feet and a what? A light unto our path. It's where, Wesley said, we find the truth. A believer simply cannot be a believer and not search the Scripture, study what the Scriptures say. So we are to attend to searching the Scriptures. One last one. Wesley said we should attend upon the ordinance of fasting or abstinence. Now, this is one that we don't talk much about today. We tell ourselves fasting is something kind of archaic. It it might have been something good and effective in the good old days, but not so much today. It's out of date and archaic. But fasting has always been taught as something we could practice that would be a good way for us to put to death our bodily desires. It's a way for us to refocus and recenter our minds and our hearts on what is most important. Fasting was a way for men and women to concentrate on the things that God has given them, those good gifts that we enjoy. Now, in Scripture, fasting was always or often accompanied by prayer. Remember, we are encouraged throughout the Scriptures to what? Fast and pray to do both. It is to bring our lives back into alignment with what God has called us to be and to do, to remind ourselves that God is the giver of all the gifts we have, and we are the receiver. That without God, we would have nothing worthwhile. Fasting is an opportunity to meditate, to think upon, to be grateful for all the things that are eternal, to remember our place among God's creation and to be thankful for all that God has given us. So Wesley said we should attend upon the ordinance of fasting or abstinence. And there you have it. Quickly, six ordinances of God, Wesley said, we should all attend to. Public worship, prayer, or the ministry of the word or preaching and, and teaching, communion, 
prayer, studying the scripture, and fasting. Without those practices, without taking those practices up, those ordinances, Wesley believed we cannot keep our spiritual lives healthy. We cannot deepen our relationship with Jesus without him. So here's the end of the basic rules to live by. Do harm or do no harm of any kind. Do good of every possible kind and attend to all the ordinances of God. To live by these ordinances, these practices, these rituals, these habits, Wesley believed, we are promised a life that is pleasing to God and a blessing to others. So let us pray. We are thankful to you, Lord, that you call us your own and you call upon us to be the best we can be, not just for our own sake, but for the sake of the world and the church that you have given to us. And we pray that you would help us to live by those ordinances you taught us, those customs, those rituals, those habits that deepen our faith and broaden our commitment to you so that we may be the people we say we are and we would become the people you've called us to be. And we ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. Now, one of those ordinances that Wesley touched upon was this act of public worship. And we always, the church has always given the the, the worshiping group or the worshiping body an opportunity to respond to the goodness of God that we've heard and experienced every time we worship. And so that's why we have a time for tithes and offerings. So as our ushers come, this is a time for you to give as a response to God's goodness toward you. And as they're coming, let's bow for a word of prayer uh, that thanks God for the good gifts we've given and to commit ourselves in the gifts to the work of the kingdom. Let's pray together. Lord God, we give you thanks for all the ways that you have been a part of our lives and provided us with everything we've needed. And we praise you and thank you now for the opportunity to return a fraction of all that you've entrusted to us. Take each gift that is given today and each one of us here and put us to work for your kingdom. And we'll be thankful. We pray it in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.
may be seated. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Jesus Christ, Christ, you are forgiven. Glory Glory to God. God. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and ever where to, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, and creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and with all the company of heaven, I will praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord God. Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection. He gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by the water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many in the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a whole and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, as that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen, amen, amen. Oh, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray together the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. 
Amen. I want to ask our stewards to come now at this time, those who will be assisting in serving. As we always do, we, we will serve one another up here, including the musicians and the ushers that want to come. We will serve them first and then ourselves. And then while we are serving everyone, we want to encourage you just to be in a moment of silence, a moment of preparation as you uh, prepare to receive this gift that is given to you. Remember, come with your hands ready to receive. Use this time, I encourage you, as a time of recommitting yourself to the life of the church and to Christ or, or committing it for the first time. This would be a great time to do that. But as we serve one another, we ask that you be in a moment of silence, and then we'll invite you all to take part. So let us be in a moment of silence. Everyone here is invited to come. No one is to be excluded from the invitation. You come, you kneel, we will serve you. Remember, if you need gluten-free to come to that far east end, we will serve you gluten-free at that point. And then if you feel led, take one of these journals and use it as a way of applying the three general rules and next week, beginning next week, the spiritual discipline. So you come as the ushers kind of give a little direction to us. If they need to, you come and we will be serving you. So you come. Nothing. Withholding nothing. 
nothing. I give you all of me. 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 Give you all of me. I give you all of me. I give you all of me. I give you all of me. My Savior forever. I'm Jesus. I give you all of me. I give you all of me. King Jesus, my Savior forever. I give you all of me. I give you all of me. I give you all of me. Withholding nothing. And I surrender all to you. And everything. I give to you withholding nothing withholding nothing withholding nothing withholding nothing up to sing your praise and there is life in every word you say come and speak to us the light you give is brighter than the sun darkness cannot overcome your love Come and shine on us. You alone are holy. The earth is full of your glory. Powerful one, for all you've done, we give you praise. our hearts with your glory God let your name flow from this place to all the earth God let your name flow from this place to all the Let us bow now for a closing prayer. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may now go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. As we prepare to be sent out, um, I ask in this moment that if, if you'd like to stand, you may. If you'd like to stay seated, um, you may as well. But we are entering a time of consecration. Um, and so as we join in this song together, um, I just ask that you would sing these words and that you truly would put your life upon the altar um, so that we would respond and that we would be changed by these three simple rules and by the grace of God at work within us. So please join us as we sing.
and nothing between my soul and my Savior. All that He asks, that will I do. Ever my will, my sin on the altar, to know you, my Lord, with nothing between. Nothing from thee will I withhold. My heart shall be my Savior's throne. What is the part of self and sin? And Jesus reigns within. Jesus, all to Jesus I surrender, make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit, let me know that thou art mine. I surrender. just a couple of gentle reminders. First of all, if you didn't pick one up and you want to pick up one of these journals, there are some out in the narthex and on the welcome desk. Please take those home if you'd like and use them as a way of connecting and applying the general rules as well as our spiritual disciplines we begin next week. Just want to remind you also that uh, the food bank, our next time to volunteer at the food bank is this coming Thursday. If you'd like to go, sign up or let us know uh, by calling. Uh, that will, The bus will be leaving here at the church at 1245. You're back before 5 o'clock. It's a lot of fun, a great service that we get to be a part of, a ministry of reaching thousands of people around the state. So I hope you'll be able to go and enjoy that time together. It's a lot of fun. Is Lee available? Is she here? She may not have made it. In. I know that Lee wanted to make an announcement uh, asking for more readers for uh, Project Transformation. We have a, a lot of kids that uh, enjoy that. All you have to do is re let them read to you. There's been a lot of good things happen because of that these past uh, several weeks. It's a lot of fun. I hope you'll be able to uh, help uh, Lee with coming for a couple of hours and just listening to the kids read and building a relationship with the kids. If you have any questions, let me know or find Lee. She's around. You can talk to her, but I know she would appreciate your help with that uh, reading project uh, ministry with the kids, okay? Okay. 
So make sure you find her and ask her the questions. She has all the answers to that. All right, hear now these words of benediction and sending forth. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you now and always. Go forth from this place into the world, letting your light so shine that others might see your good works, but then give glory to God in heaven. And together we all say, amen. Go in peace.